So uh, what I want to talk to you today is uh, one, of, one of the major avenues of research that I'm conducting right now. I just uh, have an NSF grant that I'm uh, working on. It's an extension of my postdoc work, and it's looking at dissolved gases in shallow groundwater near oil and gas production. So uh, it could be uh, related to hydraulic fracturing or oil and gas production. Uh, and I'd like to start off with this picture because uh, this is a picture of a black shale, um, organic rich shale. It's a uh, uh, more common term. It's becoming more common anyways. Um, it's an outcrop near, uh, right at the shoreline of Lake Erie. But this is what um, is being targeted for hydraulic fracturing. Uh, natural gas gets produced. It's, it's a reservoir, but it's also the source, right? So when they fracture it, uh, they're breaking it up and releasing all that methane that gets produced in all these pockets in the shale, right? Um, so, okay, I pressed the right button, good. Um, so just as an outline, I'm going to give you an introduction to motivation. I'm going to give you the case for oil and gas production for it. Uh, and then uh, I want to give you the case for investigating potential environmental impacts. Now this is a very heated subject as I've come to learn over the last two years of my, uh, in this, uh, working in this area. And uh, um, then I'll talk about research questions. I'm going to present some work I did in Pennsylvania in, from 2010 to 2012. Uh, it's overlapped with my dissertation work and then my postdoc work. Uh, and then uh, some work that I did this summer that I was feverishly working up trying to get ready to present here. And so the graphics on that are probably not as stellar as I would like it to be, but um, uh, nonetheless, I will be able to present it. And then some conclusions, observations, and recommendations. Um, so this is a map that is fairly common, fairly popular, uh, that demonstrates all the uh, shale plays. We call, it, we call them plays. These are areas that are targeted for oil and gas production um, uh, throughout the U.S. There's the Appalachian Basin. Appalachian, or you might have heard of Marcellus Shale. Um, that's sort of the big hot topic right now down in Texas is the Barnett. Uh, in Denver, where I'm working currently, there's Niobrara in the Denver Basin, and then of course in California there's the Monterey Shale, which has recently become a hot topic amongst oil and gas producers. Um, so uh, I did my dissertation work and my postdoc work uh, up in the Appalachian Basin here uh, uh, with the Marcella Shale and other organic rich shales in that area that are producing oil and gas. Uh, currently I'm working in Colorado, uh, going to expand into Wyoming and New Mexico. Uh, and then uh, I want to set up a project here in California. I'm writing a proposal to do that right now um, with, with this guy right here that just came in late. Um, um, but what do you notice about this map, right? There's a lot of areas that really don't have a whole lot of oil, oil and gas production, right? But there's some areas that do. They have a lot of historic oil and gas production. But recently, um, this technology of combining horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing has opened up a lot of new areas. There are areas in the U.S. that were once thought to not be, not have economical resources, uh, are currently do. And uh, I'll give you the example of North Carolina. Now, I did my postdoc work at Duke University in North Carolina. And so, uh, right as I was leaving, the uh, House legislature uh, was coming to grips with uh, oil and gas producers that wanted to go into North Carolina and drill and frack. And so, I think just recently, in the last few months, they passed a bill um, that would allow them to do that. Now, before I left, my postdoc advisor and I, we published a, uh, um, a little opinion piece um, uh, on um, basically taking a step backwards and say, let's, let's wait a second and see how this plays out before we go full hog, pun intended, uh, uh, into allowing oil and gas production in North Carolina. Um, North Carolina is interesting. Uh, back in the mid-'80s, they, they had this... Uh, they, their, their hog industry went, went essentially wild, but there were all kinds of environmental issues that came out of that that they weren't fully aware of. And so that was the case we were making. We were, we were trying to make the case that let's, let's take lessons from that history and go a little bit slower. So uh, importance of shale gas. Uh, in terms of the total gas production, um, since 2000, you'll see there's a little dip here, but right in the mid-2000s, there's an increase, and then there's projected out to 2014 to increase. Uh, shale gas production, and then, or no, excuse me, the total gas production, but then the, mm -hmm. the, the shale gas production is also expected to increase, right? This is the gas that comes from these shale units that's, that's being <coughs> cracked, right? And so, um, and, and so the percentage of it's expected to increase as well. So it becomes really important. And 
This figure is a little outdated. This is from Pennsylvania. There, there are two counties, Susquehanna County and Bradford County, where I did most of my sampling. Um, uh, but I wanted to show this to you just to give you a little bit more context. Uh, about in 2007, there was renewed interest in hydraulic fracturing in this area. Uh, because uh, there was a company called Range Resources that, just for shits and giggles, uh, decided they would frack one of their old wells that had not stopped producing. And uh, lo and behold, they got production numbers through the roof. And everybody's ears perked up, and they're like, oh, wow, this hydraulic fracturing stuff is pretty cool. So um, that's when the Marcellus really took off, in about October of 2007. And so this graph represents uh, a number of wells that were drilled, oil and gas wells, that were drilled in these two counties. And you'll see that the number of those wells uh, increased quite significantly. Just, just up to 2010, I need to actually update this. Um, uh, so this technology has really renewed a lot of interest, uh, not only in areas where there's been historic oil and gas production, but in areas where there hasn't been. So the basics of it is uh, essentially uh, they inject large volumes of chemically treated waters. These, these waters are intended to do various things, right, from dissolve easily dissolvable minerals to uh, reduce scale, etc. At uh, extremely high pressures. Now in Pennsylvania, the, the volumes tend to be on the order of between seven and 12 million gallons, right? Um, or even more in some cases, and upwards of 10,000 psi. Um, stimulate fluid flow in the zone of uh, uh, in the zone of interest to the well. So if we imagine this is organic wood shale, this is of course idealized, right? There are plenty of fractures that may exist in this zone, but this is a graphic you see on, on a lot of industry websites. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's intended to break up the rock in the zone of interest and release these gases and have them migrate to the well and, and be harvested. Um, but it, well, another important point is the recipe and the technique can vary depending on the geology and the company. They all have their own technique, their own recipe, um, and they don't like to share it. Um, this is another graphic you see uh, quite often, especially in the East Coast, uh, in New York and Pennsylvania, and it basically demonstrates that um, uh, the, the zone that they're fracturing is so deep that there's no possible way, this is the argument they make, there's no possible way that uh, these, these chemicals you know, gases can migrate into shallow aquifers, which are depicted as this really thin blue line right here. Right? <laughs> Now, as a hydrogeologist, you know, I know it's much more complicated than that, right? Uh, anyhow, and uh, it's, I also want to point out, these are Empire State Buildings. They use the Empire State Building as a reference of, of depth, right? So this zone is, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine uh, Empire State Buildings deep, right? It's pretty deep, and most people can relate to that, right? in Pennsylvania, New York, et cetera. Um, but uh, some arguments that you always hear for uh, uh, natural gas extraction, and these are very powerful arguments, is that it's a large resource, especially in the US, can lead to energy independence, right? You hear that often. Uh, burns a lot of, uh, cleaner than oil, meaning less CO2, and that's true, actually. It burns much cleaner than, than coal and uh, regular uh, hydrocarbons that we use in our car. Um, though I will point out it's a much worse CO2 gas, or excuse me, a greenhouse gas, right? I think it's two and a half times worse than CO2 even. Uh, there's never been a case of documented contamination, now I put that in quotes. <laughs> because, I mean, you hear this a lot in the news and whatnot, but I don't think anybody's really looked. If you look in the literature, there's not really any uh, papers out there that, that are dedicated to looking at it from the environmental side. Um, not until recently, not until recent years. Um, and then there's, of course, the significant geologic separation. And they depict this as, you know, this, 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 this thick layering of rock and sediment that has no fractures or joints or whatnot in it. Um, which, you know, as geologists, you know, we know it's more complicated than that, right? Uh, so this is a picture of uh, one of the sites I sampled. This, there's a homeowner, and this is the edge of his property. There, you see a fence here? Uh, that's the edge of his property. Can you imagine having this next door? Um, so, uh, excuse me? With no mineral rights. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, lots of large machinery, uh, very loud, um, producing any number of gases, uh, um, maybe even after lunchtime. And um, I, I bring this up so that you guys get a perspective of, of what homeowners deal with in these, these, these territories. Now, you'll see in the background, it's quite beautiful countryside. So this breaks up the countryside. People argue about how it's an eyesore. Um, most of these areas are very rural, so they have dirt roads. This machinery tears these roads up. Now, most of the companies actually will come in and pave the roads. They, they do this as a community service because they know they're tearing up the roads. Uh, and in fact, the company that was doing this, I was told, actually built this, this wooden fence as a mitigation, a noise mitigation. Um, didn't fully work, as I understand from the homeowner. <laughs> but he, he was happy enough. He was happy enough to, to stop complaining. Um, so, and this is basically what it looks like afterwards. It's a different site. This is a different site. Uh, but if it's gas, you, basically all you'll see is a pipe coming out of the ground with maybe a little tank. And off to the side, there's a bunch of bigger tanks which collect things like brine. These are naturally occurring, very deep groundwater, very saline, up to 30% salt. Um, and can be highly toxic. And in the Marcellus case, uh, they can be even radioactive. They can have radioactivities upwards of 16,000 picocuries per liter, when the EPA standard is five. Um, so you can imagine those brines, even though they're naturally occurring, when they're brought to the surface, they become an issue, right? Um, uh, and some tanks might even hold some oil. There might be some oil that's also produced from these, uh, these gas wells. So this is what it looks like. And this is from another homeowner that I sampled. This is from their backyard. You could go up to their fence line and pretty much throw a rock and hit that well. It's pretty close. And these, get, these wells actually vent all the time. When they get overpressured, they'll vent to the atmosphere. So, um, so I, I, I like this picture because I think those of us who have grown up in urban or suburban areas, we sort of sometimes take for granted that we can turn our faucet on and get clean water. It may not taste good, but it should be safe to drink, right? People in these rural areas, all they have are their wells. And, and most of the time, I would say at least 95% of the time, they don't have any kind of treatment systems. They drink it right out of the ground. So uh, it becomes important for them to trust that they can turn on their faucet and get clean water, right? This is an advertisement uh, that I uh, acquired from uh, a group of homeowners. Um, the, their, their group is uh, Northeast Pennsylvania Gas Action. Um, if you drive around places like Dimmick, uh, Susquehanna, you'll see billboards like this, right? And that asks a very important question. And I'll ask you guys this. Would you drink this water if it came right out of your faucet? Can you imagine? Now, we sort of have to trust that that actually happened, because this is a picture they developed, right? Like, that they turned their faucet on and water came out, because that's what they're claiming. But, but regardless, um, if this is true, I mean, this is quite remarkable, right? And these are homeowners that have had wells for 10, 15 years without any problems. Right? And some of these homeowners actually could light their water on fire, and I've seen that happen. Turn the faucet on, light it on fire, poof. Um, so why study the environmental risks? I mean, this might be an obvious question, right? Um, but uh, there's potential for discharge of shallow groundwater um, and the environment, right? Not only from below, but from the ground surface as well. There are, are all kinds of uh, stories in Pennsylvania of tanks that get ruptured somehow, pipes or tubing that break uh, and release uh, uh, these fluids to the ground surface and then gets discharged. Um, uh, it can be potentially toxic or radioactive. I mentioned Marsalis brines can be highly radioactive, right? Uh, but the, the salinity, these brines can be highly toxic. They can keep trace metals that normally, at normal pH values, would not be in solution, but it keeps them in solution. The chloride is high enough concentration it complexes with these things like arsenic and cadmium, right? So they can be, uh, in addition to be highly saline, they can be highly toxic. Um, can be an explosion and asphyxiation hazard. The asphyxiation and explosion, that seems pretty obvious, right? There's been some reports of methane filling in people's basements in Pennsylvania. And, and that ba having a basement in Pennsylvania is very common. Um, 
Are there other, other health issues? What if you consume water that has high concentrations of methane? Right? There was very little of that in, of answering that in the literature, which was a surprise to me. Um, and there, there's a large number of wells in rural areas that can go untested or even unregulated. Remember, these are people in rural areas. They drink the water straight out of the ground. And most of the time, it's, it's, a lot of the time, it's not tested at all. And maybe not even unregulated. So, uh, so research questions. Uh, let, me, let me talk about this picture for a moment. That's, of course, me. This is my postdoc advisor, uh, Avner Vengo. She's a very interesting person. But anyhow, if you look in this bucket, what do you see? Yucky water. Yucky water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a, a well at somebody's house. And interesting story. Um, it had a lock on it, which was put there by the, comp the gas company that operated the, the local gas well. And we told them we were going to, we had permission to sample the well, and we told them we were going to be there on such and such a day at such and such a time. You need to remove your lock or we will remove it, because we had permission to do so. And an hour before we showed up, they showed up and pumped the heck out of this well. Huh. Right? Thinking that it would, they would make it go dry and it would make it more difficult for us to sample. But they actually did us a favor. Right? They, they pumped, they, I don't know how much they pumped, but I'm told they pumped for quite a long time. Um, and so uh, this water that we actually sampled is actually formation water. It's not water that's sort of stagnant in the well and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's pretty yucky water. So anyways, the research questions I'm working with are, are private wells in close proximity to natural gas wells more likely to show evidence of contamination, if at all? Now in this talk, I'm going to be talking about dissolved gases mostly, but there are other things that we were looking at. There's salinity, there's other things like boron. Boron's a common additive in fracking fluids. So we're looking at boron concentrations, boron uh, isotopes. I'm not presenting it here, but, but um, those are other things that we're looking at. Uh, if we see evidence, what is the source of these fluids? Can we identify the source? Is it a natural source? Is it a non-natural source? Um, and then is, is me if, if that's the case, then the next question is, is it microbial? Is methane microbial in origin? Are these microbes that are producing methane in the subsurface? Or is it what we call thermogenic? Thermogenic are, is gases that are produced by thermal catalytic breakdown of organic matter at depth. You know, at, at deep, uh, uh, deep geologic formations that are under high temperatures, right? And that becomes important because if we identify this thermogenic methane in the shallow groundwater, it had to have migrated there somehow. There has to be some conduit to get it there. So uh, let me talk about the Pennsylvania work. This is work I did in the summer of 2010, 2011. I published it in 2011 in PNAS. We collected 68 samples throughout the northeast corner of Pennsylvania, a couple up here in uh, Otsego County, New York. Um, we divided our samples into two groupings. One grouping uh, of wells of uh, domestic homeowners that are within one kilometer of a gas well. And then the, the other grouping is homeowners that are further than one kilometer. Uh, and this distance was purely arbitrary. We wanted to divide our, our data into two groups to make comparisons. Those that are close and those that are further away. And so the, the further away people are these triangles. And uh, uh, this is a place in Dimmick, which is right in here. There's Montrose and Brooklyn. And uh, in this particular area, uh, there's a wave of oil and gas production that's moving eastward. So these areas like Brooklyn and Montrose are now sort of overtaken by uh, oil and gas drilling. Well, it's really only gas drilling. Um, so, so we collected what might be considered now as baseline data at the time. But now uh, we, we hope to go back and, and sample these, these areas again to see how they've changed, if they have. Right? But then, there, of course, there's other areas here. And these, these little gray dots represent location of oil and gas wells that existed at the time we sampled. Um, so there's a bunch here in, D in the Dimmick area that are near um, uh, gas wells. So we'll call these active extraction areas. They're, these are homeowners that are within one kilometer. And then non-active areas, these are homeowners that are greater than one kilometer. Um, this is just a geologic map. The only, only reason why I want to show it is that uh, there's this, this whole, the geology of this area is really complicated. Is anybody familiar with this part of the area, the geology of this part of the area? It's really complicated. There's been four orogenies over the last billion years. Appalachian Mountains, all kinds of faults and folds and, 
And uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if it's uh, maybe a structural geologist's nightmare or not. Maybe they love it, I don't know. But anyways, the point of it is, is there's a lot of deformation, there's a lot of faulting, there's a lot of joint sets um, that could be used as conduits for, for fluid flow. So uh, this, is, this, the, 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 this is a figure from the paper I published that was quite controversial. And I got a lot of flack for it. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, that's why we do science, right? Uh, so this is a, a figure of distance to the nearest gas well in meters. On the x-axis, on the y-axis, we have methane concentrations in milligrams of methane per liter of water. And this gray area represents uh, an action level um, that was set by the Department of Interior for mitigation. Now, you might see, it might seem kind of odd that they stopped it at about 28, right? Because you don't see concentrations much higher than that often. But we did. And boy, did we. So, um, so this is our cutoff here, this one, this one kilometer or 1,000 meters, right, between the active and non-active. And most of the non-active concentrations we got in, two, in, our, in our sampling in 2010 were maybe background trace sort of levels, fairly low levels, um, on the order of 0 0.001 or something, right? Uh, there was one sample that we collected in this area that had fairly high methane concentrations. And this, I should point out, this area is actually known historically, before there was even oil and gas production, to have methane seeps every once in a while, here and there, right? Um, but as you get closer, you get, uh, get closer that one, uh, into that 1,000 meter mark, you see that these concentrations wrap up significantly in many of the samples. About half of the samples we collected that were from active wells had fairly significant methane concentrations. The other half might still be considered part of this background sort of level, right? About 85% of the samples we collected had detectable methane of all the samples we collected that year. So the next step, we, so this was just looking at methane concentrations. Uh, so active areas were on average 17 times higher compared to non-active areas in terms of their concentration. What do you mean by active extraction? Uh, these are areas, uh, we define that as Area, uh, homeowners that were within one kilometer. They're in a, a, within one kilometer of a gas well that's actively being used and producing that gas. So it's sort of an arbitrary de definition, but. So an, extract, an active extraction, okay, that's not the actual well. That's, that's in yeah, the, 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 they're within one, one kilometer of a well that's actively producing gas. And actively producing gas means they've been fracked? Yes. Um, so, where was I? Okay, so, uh, then, we, then we decided to look at the chemistry of the methane. The, the first step was just to look at the concentration, the relationship with the gas wells. Uh, so here, this top one is what's called a Bernard plot. So it, it, we're trying to identify if it's microbial or thermogenic gas, distinguish between the two. Because microbes that produce methane really only produce methane. They don't produce higher chain hydrocarbons like ethane and propane and butane. Um, we look at this ratio of methane to higher chain hydrocarbons, right? So we would expect microbial methanogenesis, methane produced from that, to have really high ratios, right? That, that should make sense, I hope. But we also look at the carbon isotopes of methane, and the carbon isotopes are fractionated, or they're made more negative, uh, considerably more negative, so, uh, to, uh, more negative than about negative 60 or 62. Uh, then uh, thermogenic gas, it's produced by thermal catalytic break, uh, breakdown of organic matter produces, in addition to methane, ethane, propane, butane, and whatnot. So we'd expect lower ratios, but they also have less negative um, carbon isotope values. Right? So we have separation in these, in these two fields. And these gray, these, this gray data is actual gas data that's being produced from <coughs> gas wells at depth. Right? So we, we put that on there for reference. So most of the gas that's being produced from the gas wells in this region um, are, in fact, thermogenic gas, right? Uh, and then uh, a lot of the samples in active areas that we, we collected here are also produce uh, thermogenic gas. Now, uh, I should also point out there's a little orange thing right here. It's hard to see. But uh, we, got, uh, we got actual data from the gas well uh, that was within the one kilometer of some of the homeowners that we collected, of the actual well. And sure enough, the, the gas that's dissolved in their water overlaps with the gas that's being produced from that gas well. 
Now, not all the samples did this, and we had some samples that plot in the sort of in-between field, which indicates mixing between some microbial source and some thermogenic source in varying degrees. <coughs> uh, it's also important to point out that in the active areas, the active extraction areas, we had 21 detections of ethane, 8 detections of propane, 2 detections of butane. And remember, those are indicators of thermogenic gas, right? Because that's where it's produced. Um, whereas in the active, non-active areas, we only had 3 detections of ethane and no detections of propane or butane. So that's another indicator. Chemistry tells us it's mostly thermogenic gas, right? Um, so then uh, in 2012, we did more field work. Uh, this is a paper that was just published this year. Fortunately, the figure isn't looking as good as I had hoped, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, it was just published as a follow-up. We did a lot more sampling, as you can tell. Um, but we see pretty much the same trends. As you get closer and closer to the, the gas well, the concentrations tend to ramp, ramp up. It's important to note, though, that not all of the homeowners, if you're really close to a well, are going are gonna to have issues. Some of them don't, but some of them do. Uh, and then we looked at ethane concentrations here, and then this inset, this is propane. So as you get closer and closer to the gas well, you, you're more likely to see higher concentrations of ethane, which is again an indicator of thermogenic gas. And then in this case also, uh, we have some hits of propane, which is even higher chain hydrocarbon. So it largely backs up the 2011 study that we published. We just backed it up with more data. Um, there was one important criticism, though, that I'm trying to follow up with is how do we know that the oil and gas wells were drilled there because the groundwater has higher concentrations of methane and not the reverse? In other words, the methane didn't show up there because of the gas well. Do you, you see what I mean? Right? And that's an important criticism, and I think I might be able to address this with work that I, done, that I have done this year. In fact, I need to look, go back and look at my data from Pennsylvania. I, I'll point that out in a moment. So uh, let me talk about my Colorado work. This is work I did this year, this summer. Uh, I spent four weeks in Colorado. We collected 40 shallow groundwater samples uh, in Weld, Boulder, in De Adams counties. So that's in this area right here. Uh, and that's indicated by the red circles with the black borders. Those are the groundwater samples we collected. We collected a bunch of... Uh, River water samples this is the South Platte River uh, before uh, as part of our field work in the early part of summer, but then I went back there two weeks ago when they had all the flooding and I sampled again. There's some evidence that a lot of the oil and gas infrastructure there was damaged because of the flooding and so we, uh, I went back there and tested the flood waters and that was a whole other experience. Uh, so if we look a little bit closer, uh, this is, uh, these are all the samples we collected. Boulder, it's like somewhere around here. Denver is right here, um, and uh, you, I, as a side note, Weld, there, there is a, a political push in Weld County to separate from Colorado and become a separate state. Uh, there are a lot of political reasons for that. Uh, again, these, are, these blue squares represent the river samples that we collected, and these d dark bl uh, blue squares are we, where we sampled post-flooding. Uh, a, a lot of these areas were not accessible because of the flooding. Um, so. But uh, if we now add where all the oil and gas wells are, uh, these are just little gray triangles, right? So you can see the, the intensity of the oil and gas here. It's, the countryside's littered with drilling masts, uh, oil and gas fluids to migrate through the geologic column from these depths into the shallow. It might be some ridiculous number that we can actually discount, but we need to know that. Uh, establish stronger baseline data in areas targeted for natural gas extraction, right? Uh, as a corollary to that, how do, you, how do you identify environmental impacts in areas that have had 100 years or more of historic oil and gas production? Right? Some people like to say, well, you know, we've had, it, we've had oil and gas here for 100, 100 years. Did I do this again? <laughs> we've had it for 100 years, so there must not be any environmental impacts. Right? Or there is, but we can't identify anything. So it becomes important to identify uh, in areas that, that are targeted for oil and gas production, but also historic areas. Distinguish between this natural and non-natural signal. You know, which is it? Some combination of both, maybe? Uh, data should be made publicly available where possible, um, but um, 
trying to be sensitive to homeowner privacy issues. A lot of homeowners in Pennsylvania don't want to be bothered uh, and, or bullied. They just want to be left alone. They want to have their water clean. So they don't want to be part of this whole issue. And I, I respect that. Um, some ongoing research. Um, I'm going to continue my, my uh, work in Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico. I'm funded for five years. I just finished my first year. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be out there for, through 2017 collecting as much data as I can. I um, want to compare it to what's going on in Pennsylvania. The data I already collected. And there's a lot of data that's being produced from other researchers in Pennsylvania. So there's, fairly, there's beginning to be a ro more robust data set there. Uh, I want to trace fluid flow and understand mechanisms of fluid flow. Uh, and I want to start research here in uh, California. This is something that uh, Flandra and I are talking about doing um, with the Monterey Shale. I am um, also have a side project with the Inglewood oil field in the Los Angeles Basin that I'm working on. Um, so this is some of my ongoing research. Um, these are uh, entities I'd like to thank. Uh, my co-authors at Duke, um, uh, Fred and Alice Stanback, they provide a lot of funding for my research while I was at Duke. Um, uh, and then the NSF, uh, NSF Sustainability Research Network. Uh, of uh, uh, funding that I got for this this year with my colleagues in Colorado. Uh, and I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs> yeah. Um uh you know the number I, I don't have a number offhand, but um one statistic I saw was that it has about one fifth of the shale gas reserves of the U.S. Wow. Potentially, uh, but there there are some complicating issues. The Monterey Shale is a siliceous shale, so it's very different than say the the, the Marcellus in terms of its physical attributes. It's more brittle, so it may or may not be fractured to the same extent. Uh, there's some controversy as whether whether it will in fact produce that that amount of gas, even though it exists there. But when, well, then this is the Energy Information Administration that came out with the statistic like a year or two ago, right? Um, so when it came out, all, all the ears perked up. Everybody was like, oh, hey, let's go to the, that re highly regulated state and see if we can produce more oil and gas, right? <laughs> but I mean, it becomes an economic question. So, so there's a lot of interest, and I want to be on the ground floor on it, doing the environmental side. So, any other? So, um all of those explanations of migration from deep or leaking wells, those really have nothing to do with fracking. I mean, the, this, this new do they? kind of idea of fracking. Do they? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Do they? Because a lot of those wells are older. Have all those wells that you showed gone through this sort of fracking post-2007 sort of... Most of them, I would say yes. All those gray triangles you showed? Yes, most, the vast majority of them, I would say yes. Yes, they have. And so, uh, but let's consider, right, so... Because uh, that's a different issue then from the migration. Not necessarily. Let's think about it, though. So, um, uh, it's not that I'm suggesting that they're creating new fractures all the way to the surface. They, they probably, all the evidence that I've seen, they, they do, in fact, create these fractures in this limited zone. But if you consider that fractures already exist there, and they're changing equilibriums, right, these, uh, the equilibriums that occur there, it can cause uh, maybe communication between natural j joint sets and fractures that exist there. Would you agree with that? Right? So, to say that it's not fracking, I, I don't think we have the evidence to say it's not. Right? We need more data. And that's why I'm actually saying oil and gas production, but not, so I'm including fracturing, hydraulic fracturing in the, in the. So I guess the question is, if you could have gone back to 2005 before this boom of fracking and done your same experiments, would you get the same sort of results? Well, they weren't fracking like this back then. That's, that's what I'm okay, okay, so yeah, um, I don't know. That's an important question. Because it's, I, I would, I would say, uh, uh, I w uh, you know, uh, this idea of getting baseline data is, is really important. That was a big criticism I got. But you can see it's, it's, it's impossible to get baseline data in areas that already have had historic oil and gas. But that experiment's being done right now because you said in Pennsylvania they're sweeping to the east. So what so we did... areas you've collected, yeah. data, they're probably fracking in right now. Right. But, uh, but so at the time, though, in 2010, uh, what we, we did what we felt was the next best thing. We made a comparison between areas that didn't have any oil and gas production and nearby areas that did. 
and that were fracked. And we saw that there were distinct differences, right? Um, now, there's people that don't accept that. But if you look at, say, um, the, the research on smoking, it's possible to get baseline data for that, right? To, to sample people that before they started smoking, right? So, so we did what we felt was the next best thing. But we, we definitely need more data. Now, North Carolina represents an opportunity. Right? My colleagues back there are, are working on that right now to, 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 to get, get actual baseline data in an area that hasn't had any oil and gas production. Now, undoubtedly, there might be some people here and there that have some methane in there, some significant amount of methane naturally occurring in their groundwater. Um, but if we see a statistical uh, increase, say, um, that might be might, might indicate some. But I don't think I don't think we have the data to to discount hydraulic fracturing. But did right? you go, are you going to go back and resample those areas that are now drilling in in Pennsylvania? Oh yeah, yeah. My colleagues are. I, I'm not involved with that field work. So we'll have. But an but they are. That, yeah. You know. In yeah. A year or two. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're continuing that work. Yeah. Absolutely. What about the Bakken Shale? Uh, I'd like to go there, but I'm I'm sort of like. I'm sort of like time limited. <laughs> you know, I, I got a, a full plate with Colorado, and I want to work here in California closer to home. Um, but, but yeah, and I think there are people, my, my old PhD advisor, in fact, is working up in the Bakken Bach, Shale now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, there are, are people working there. And so my idea in the future, say in a couple years, when we have more robust data sets, combine all these data sets nationwide. Right? Look and see where there are issues. Look and see where there are not. Maybe create some sort of conceptual model. Right? So. So they go in and they frack, and all of a sudden they're getting methane at the surface. So there's a time lag in between. And can that help you uh, determine a little bit better what the source is, whether it's shallow versus, I mean, that's really fast. Yeah, yeah. So one important, uh, you, you bring up an important point. What we, the samples we collected were sort of points in time, right? They were sort of grab samples. Um, what I want to do is I want to be able to sample people's wells in real time with a Picaro that measures methane isotopes of methane before, during, and after fracking, right? Um, my colleagues in Colorado just purchased a, isotope, a Pacaro isotope analyzer to do that very thing. And so I'm, I'm setting up a project in Colorado right now. There's an area that um, uh, it, the, the Chevron, no, Shell, I think, is going into that they're about to drill. And we want to go in there and sample before they drill, after they drill, before they frack, after they frack and do it in real time. So we get this time sequence of data. I think that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What type of variability is there in, what, in homeowner well penetration depth? And could that give you insight as to? Uh, you mean the domestic wells? Yeah. Uh, the wells we sampled range from about 60 feet in depth to about 500 feet in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Colorado is about 50 or 60 feet to 800 We're feet. We're in the same range. 800 get like, for domestic wells? Yeah. Do you get a depth distribution in the close region so that you could potentially see differences in, in, in sampling depth? Uh, that, yeah, we should look at that. Yeah, well, we I mean, haven't is, done that. Is that even possible? Or is it, it yeah, like, well, it depends. I mean, I think, I, I think as we get more sampling locations, we'll be able to do some statistical analysis on that, yeah. Uh, I don't know that we can do that on, on like 40, because you said the region that we're covering. It's a yeah. fairly wide region. Oh, yeah. um, although there was one area within a region where we did a higher density of sampling. And we did that only because there was a tremendous amount of uh, oil and gas activity there. I mean, it was just incredible how much drilling and fracking was going on while we were there. And so we decided, OK, you have a neighbor that has a well? Yeah, I do. Well, call them up. We'll, we'll sample. Uh, so we did. there was a smaller area that we did higher density of sampling. Yeah. But uh, I, think, uh, I think you're right, though. As, as my data set develops in the next couple of years, we can start doing that, that kind of analysis. But that might be a problem, no? Because we are not interested in that. You want distance from the fracturing. So oh, is that what you were referring to? No, he's, uh, I mean, it's the depth of the well. Yeah, the depth of the, the depth right. of the well. It, it might give us the wrong information because it's just the depth. Right. The actual migration is through from the depth. Fracture distance to the well. Right. right. So that might complicate our problem understanding more. And I, and I should point out, in the area that we sample in Colorado, actually the, the unit that's being produced there is a little bit shallower than what uh, the Marcellus is in Pennsylvania. That was going to be my question. So yeah, so. Much shallower. Uh, I think it's on the order of, uh, so like in, uh, like a thousand feet or so, or so a little bit more. So is that shallow enough that there's going to be a significant difference in the origin of the methane? That's a good question. That's a good question, yeah. Yeah, we, we need to look at that. I mean, you think certainly, 
uh, depth might play a very important role on that. Because in the Pennsylvania stuff, you could show the you know the stuff was clearly thermogenic. Right. I don't know if you could do that for the Colorado. Maybe. Well, Colorado. we see is microbial. We don't see any evidence so far. So the production this, walls are microbial as well. Uh, no, they're not. Okay, so the so the, the gas the methane producing wells the, the industry wells that, that are those are actually thermogenic. Yeah. Ah, okay, that's interesting. So then the question, next question is, why is that? Why is there such a difference between what's going on in Colorado and what's going on in Pennsylvania? I think it's the, the geology. Yeah. The fact that there's more faulting and folding, and that's not to say it's not happening in Colorado, but I think the scale is different. Um, well, do you think that the, the so I, one of the questions I have is if the lithology of the, the overburden, if you will, um, is such that you're more likely to have you know, methane producing bugs in Colorado than what you have in we don't know. I mean, one of the things we actually did was, uh, and I should point out, uh, I collaborated with a microbiologist at Colorado, and she sampled in parallel with us, and she was sampling microbial communities in parallel with the samples I was collecting. And there's no microbial methanogens in, the, uh, at least what she's told me in her preliminary results. There doesn't appear to be any microbial methanogens in the shallow groundwater there. Even though we see concentrations of it, so that indicates that it's coming from some intermediate zone into the shallow, it's not being produced in the shallow zone. Uh, I think, w w based on what I've seen preliminarily, it's mostly sulfate reducing zone. So, so below that should be the microbes. Yeah, and it's somehow migrating into the shallow zone. Right? But but the, these differences are important. We can ask questions: Why is that? Right between what's going on in Pennsylvania and what's going on in Colorado, and maybe even what's going on here in California. Is there any possibility that the fracking is stimulating I was just some ambient methanogens that like the fracking fluid? And that might be the difference um, because of different companies? Well, no, I mean, they actually, a lot of their additives are designed to kill microbes. Right, so, right. Right. Interesting, though. I mean, yeah. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I think we have some time, don't we? Do we sure. have some time? Yeah. Okay, so I went to, uh, in 2011, I went to an EPA workshop, and um, it was a room full of researchers. I was included because uh, it was known that I was, into the, I was doing this kind of work. A uh, bunch of industry people, the people that have been fracking for 50 or 60 years, right? Uh, and a bunch of regulatory people, EPA, USGS. So there was this heady mix of people from all sides of this issue. They wanted to get us together to talk about what's going on. And this is when they were trying, the EPA was trying to get their study going. You might have heard that they were trying to get a fracking study going, right? Uh, so they wanted to get input from all sides and try and design a, an experiment, and which sort of fell apart a little bit. Anyhow, um, so there was a moment where we had this sort of open forum discussion. Anybody could ask a question of anybody else, right? And so I asked this question. I said, so you're injecting all these fluids at really high pressures. What happens to that pressure? You know, not all of those waters come out. Not all the pressure is released when it comes out as flowing, flow back. What happens to that pressure wave? I mean, does it continue to propagate through the geologic column? I mean, you would know more about that than I do. I mean, that was maybe a stupid question on my part, but nobody answered. Nobody answered. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they didn't know or they didn't want to answer, but, but, uh, but, but if you consider that if you have a, a, some propagation of pressure or something working its way through the geologic column, right, it's changing these equilibriums that exist. And when you change these equilibriums, you, you exolve gases that might be dissolved under uh, certain pressures, right? And that might force these gases to migrate uh, upwards. So I mean, I think there's a chain reaction of events that could, I'm not saying they are, could be happening. Right? That's why we don't have enough data, I don't think, to, to fully discount hydraulic fracturing as, as a, a, its own, own, It'd own thing. It would be interesting to see if the, the, micro, if the, the methane genetics, the source of it, might evolve through time and become more yeah. microbial as they are starting to stimulate yeah. Yeah. or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh, we, we can test that in time. We just need more time, more data. Cool. Are there more questions? Yeah. yeah. Is there any uh, oil, was there any oil production in the Colorado area when you took previous? Uh, yeah, but I'll tell you that uh, uh, there was a significant uh, increase since about 2007. Um, but so yeah, the areas that we that we uh, sampled, there has been historic oil and gas production. Yeah, okay. yeah. Because I know that uh, there was you know there's a lot of methane in the Playa Vista area uh -huh. here in, in Southern California, and we had a lot of uh, basically microbial, 
microbially generated methane. Uh -huh. And the idea that it was associated with the hydrocarbon contamination that they were basically eating up and generating their own uh -huh. methane. So I thought maybe if there was enough oil contamination in Colorado, maybe those microbes are producing the methane by eating up that maybe. contamination. Maybe. I mean, but if uh, there, if you go to Michigan, for example, the Antrim Shale, it's all microbial. It's very little thermogenic gas being produced. It's all microbial. Um, so there are economic reservoirs of microbial methane being produced from shales. There's, I mean, we know that occurs. Um, it depends on the environmental conditions. So it could be something like what you're describing, or it just could be there might be an intermediate organic source somewhere that, that's producing this methane. It could be for example, that uh, methane is migrating from depth into this intermediate zone where it sort of hangs out for a little while. Microbes are there. It's producing, uh, it can produce methane there if there's CO2. May, there might be CO2 coming up. But we can look at the isotopes. Uh, that, that tell us. That can tell us the source. Uh, especially if we look at carbon isotopes of methane. That can tell us the source. If it's the, sh if it's the shale or if it's some other organic matter source. Yeah. What makes the uh, brine from the Rosellas radioactive? Um, there are uh, sources of radioactivity in the shale itself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's not to say all brines are like that. The, the, the Marcellus is known to have radioactive brines. Um, um, but uh, I, don't think, I don't think the brines being produced in Michigan have the, uh, are known to be radioactive. And I don't think in Colorado it's the case either. Um, but, but yeah. So. And so with those brines, they're way more radioactive than the rock itself. Are you just like leaching out all these soluble radioactive elements and concentrating them into the water? Well, consider that these are brines that are Paleozoic seawater, right? <laughs> and these are very old waters that are separated, largely separated from the hydrologic cycle. You know, so like the Appalachians where one time there was a seaway, right? And as it got buried, those, those, uh, that seawater became evaporated some. That's why we have large salt deposits there, right? Michigan, for example, right below the Lake Michigan, there's all these huge salt deposits that are being mined directly below the lake, right? Um, so, so these are very old waters and over geologic time, um, it, you know, accumulates things which aren't very good. Well, that was a really fascinating talk. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.